All right, let's go ahead and get started. Go and grab a seat. Happy Father's Day. So good to see you. Please, 13 years old and up, like get one of these. Uh, well, you got to provide your own batteries, but uh, you get that action, and then you can hang it, go camping, do all kinds of fun stuff. So that's our gift to you to celebrate Father's Day. We're also, tomorrow, we're celebrating Juneteenth. If you don't know about Juneteenth, it, too, it took two extra years uh, that, uh, for the emancipation to get news to slaves in Texas. And so that was a state holiday that became a federal holiday that's celebrated tomorrow. And so whether you're just teaching your children, learning about black history, going to a black business, let's celebrate uh, Juneteenth tomorrow. That's going to be fun. But before we get into 1 Corinthians, I want to just acknowledge the Lord's provision for our church family. Like we are obviously self-admittedly in a season of transition, right? Lots of moving parts right now in North Village Church. But God has been so good to us. Did y'all see James Gordon teaching us last Sunday? That was awesome. Yeah. Yeah, a couple of weeks ago we had Roberto Moctezuma teaching us. Uh, in a couple of weeks we'll have Risa Browning teaching us. And it's, it's not just these men, but our elders are leaning into this transition. The men and women of our church family are leaning into this transition. And that just I just don't want us to miss that. Like it's not a guarantee that in the midst of transition that people lean in. <laughs> in the midst of transition, we, we get filled with doubts and questions and insecurities, and sometimes we just disperse. But in God's, like, we're not through the transition yet, but the fact that we already see just evidence of His Spirit uh, alive and at work in our church family just needs to be uh, celebrated. And so just so thankful uh, for that. This morning, we are going to be in 1 Corinthians 11. You can turn to page 167, your devotional, go to your Bible this is probably the most unique Father's Day sermon in the history of Father's Day, right? I mean, which of us thought we were going to get a sermon on hats and the hats that women wear, right? That's the passage we're looking at this morning on how big should your hat be, right? And, and at the surface, it is about women uh, having a head covering, but hang in there with me. Because below the surface, there is a challenge for our men. And, and I think it will apply to uh, Father's Day. So let's, let's dig into it. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1. The Apostle Paul, he writes, Be imitators of me, the Apostle Paul, just as I also am of Christ. So verse 1 is really kind of the concluding of chapter 10. Right, you know, uh, Roberto walked us through chapter eight. James walked us through chapter ten, eight, nine, and ten. It's about the the Corinthian church engaging the culture. And the Apostle Paul, he gets to chapter eleven, verse one, and he says, "Look, I know it's complicated. I know it's difficult. At the end of the day, just follow me." Right? The Apostle Paul, he knows what it's like to be in religious cultures. He knows what it's like to be judged for what you wear, what you say, where you're born, your family name. He knows the cancel culture. Like, he grew up in it, and so he knows it's complicated. And so he says to the Corinthian church, follow me. Follow me as I follow Christ. Really, that is the heartbeat of our church family. I mean, in today's culture of 2023, where there are conversation starters, I mean, it feels like every week there's a new, like, did you know, right, conversation, and, you know, and how you navigate that as a church family. There's none of us that have it all figured out. We're all learning from one another as we ultimately follow Christ, and so do you shop at Target? Do you watch Disney? Like, do you attend that wedding? Do you have that conversation with your child? How do you handle it with HR in the workplace? Like, what do you do as a follower of Jesus in 2023? It's so difficult. Like, we're all learning from one another, following one another as we ultimately follow Christ, right? And he goes to verse 2. Verse 2, he writes, Now, I praise you, the Corinthian church, he's encouraging them, because you remember me in everything, and you hold firmly to the tradition just as I have delivered them to you. So in verse 2, the Apostle Paul, he's going to pivot. Right? He's been talking about how do you engage the culture of the day, and now he's going to pivot to talking about the details of what it looks like in a worship service. All right, this is really common in the New Testament letters. The first few chapters, it's about theology. It's doctrine. This is what we believe. And then there's a pivot to what does it look like practically. That's what the Apostle Paul has been doing. He's been getting into the practical details of life. So he goes into verse 3. He says, But 
I want you to understand that Christ is the head of every man. And the man is the head of a woman. And God is the head of Christ. All right, there it is. That's the verse. This is the type of verse that somebody puts on social media is like, I gotcha. Right? I told you the Bible's oppressive towards women. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 3. Let's read it again in case you're like, wait, what? Like, he says, but I want you to understand that Christ is the head of every man. We're like, all right. And then this line, that man is the head of a woman and God is the head of Christ. I mean, there should be a part, if you're paying attention, he's like, head of every woman? Like, what? are we talking about? And so that's why they'll take that phrase and they'll say, see, the Bible's oppressive towards women. But you need to know that, that the scripture, that God's word is anything but oppressive towards women. I mean, the New Testament writers, the apostles were radical in their day in being pro-women. Like in the first century, it would have been the norm that women were less than. Right? It would have been the norm that in the synagogues of the day that men sat on one side and women sat on the other side and they didn't intermingle. And then Jesus shows up. He changes everything. Men and women worshiping the Lord together. Men and women serving the Lord together. Men and women being indwelled by the Holy Spirit, used by God in a powerful way. And so please, don't let those... Don't let those gotcha moments get you, right? Please do not believe that the Bible is oppressive towards women. The only way the Bible could be a, oppressive towards women is if you don't understand the Bible. Because it's not. There's just no way you could take that away from, from God's Word. So that's really a question that each of us, whether you're, whether you're five years old or whether you're 100 years old, as a follower of Jesus, each of us needs to really wrestle, what do I think about God's Word? Like, do I believe God's word is God's word? Or do I believe God's word is just a collection of spiritual thoughts for me to consider? That's really when it comes to the conversation we're having today. But in all areas of our faith, do I think the Bible is just a phrases, thoughts, that really I am the decider based on my experiences, my emotions, and my education. I'll decide what God's word has to say. Or is it God's word that sits over my life, that's the final authority in my life? And if I don't understand it, if I don't like it, it's not because God's word has a problem. It's because I don't understand, and I need to sit, and I need to wrestle, and I can't just flip through social media to understand it. And that's what we're going to do today. We're going to dig into our passage to understand what God's word has to say. So that first word. Now, first word, verse 3 says, but, right? He's given a contrast. It's a contrast from verse 2. In verse 2, the Apostle Paul is actually complimentary towards the Corinthian church. You remember? He says, I praise you. This is chapter 11. This is the first time that he's encouraged the Corinthian church. For 11 chapters, he's like, rebuke, 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 rebuke. Turn the page. Rebuke, rebuke. And then chapter 11, he's like, okay, one encouragement. I praise you that you're holding fast to my, to my teaching, the traditions. That's what Apostle Paul has been teaching. And then he's going to challenge him a little bit in verse 3. He says, but I want you to understand right, that you're losing a layer of authority in this conversation around men and women. You're losing a layer of authority. Michael, how do you know he's talking about authority in that passage? Well, if you scan down to verse 10, he tells you he's talking about authority, right? So that alone. But then also just that word head. That word head is, is a connotation of authority, like a, a head master. And so in verse 3, he's talking about spiritual authority, spiritual leadership that's being lost in the worship service of the Corinthian church because they're confused about what it means to be a man and what it means to be a woman, right? It's almost like they ripped it from the headlines of 2023, right? So, so good, so good. God's word, so good, right? So you need to know that's what we're going to be digging into today is that spiritual authority, right, of, of what does it mean to be a, a biblical man and a biblical woman and how does that 
present itself in the context of a worship service. So you just need to know right off the bat, when, when people read verse 3, there's kind of an extreme conservative view, an extreme liberal, liberal view, right? An extreme conservative view is that all men have all authority over all women, right? That's the extreme view. I don't think that's what that passage is teaching. I don't think it's teaching that all men have all authority over all women all the time because the context of the passage, it's about the local church. It's about the worship service. So he's not, he's talking about in the context of the local church, what does it look like to have that spiritual leadership, that spiritual authority? That's what we're going to be digging out. The extreme liberal view is that that word head, it's not about authority at all. They disregard verse 10. They're like, no, that word head is just in the last few years, mainly out of like feminist writing. That word head is actually the word source, like the source of a river. And so that men and women are connected. It has nothing to do with authority. But you need to know there's no time when that word head is used in ancient writings that it ever means source. It always means authority. And you'll see that in the context of of our passage today. It's talking about authority. I mean, looking at verse 3 alone, Christ is the head of every man. It's about authority. The man is the head of a woman. It's about authority, right? God is the head of Christ. It's about authority. So that's what we're talking about. Look, the feminist movement has been so helpful in history. There are so many good things that have come out of the feminist movement that as a follower of Jesus, we can applaud, we can praise, and we can say that's great. But one way the feminist movement has not been helpful, you could even argue that the feminist movement has been hurtful, is that in the attempt to show that men and women are equal, that when you listen, when you watch, when you read, they will describe that men and, e- and women are the same. Does that make sense? Listen, God's word in no way says that men and women are the same. Men and women are equal in value, but men and women have different roles male and female he created them both in the image of God first Peter that male and and female are co-heirs to the grace of life so that they have equal value but different roles right that's what we're digging into so you look at the trinity father son and spirit they have equal values but they have different roles right they have, they have different responsibilities. In no way would we want to say they're all the same. If you look at a sports team like soccer, Sophia, you play soccer? On a soccer field, you have 11 players, right? They're all equally valuable, but no one player is more important, right, Sophia? Right? The, the goalie <laughs> is just as important as the forward, right? The forward is just as important as the the goalie, right? There are times, right, Sophia, in a, in a soccer game where a goalie, a goalie will give direction to other players, and you will use your authority, and you will tell other players what to do, right? But that doesn't mean you're more important as a goalie. It just means you have different responsibilities. They're all equally valuable. That's what we're talking about. And that's what God's Word is wanting to capture that. In male and female, they're both equally valuable. They just have different roles. Look at verses 4 and 5. You'll see how it fleshes out. It says, Every man who has something on his head while praying or prophesying disgraces his head. But every woman who has her head uncovered while praying or prophesying disgraces her head, for she is one and the same as the woman whose head is shaved. What? You're like, that doesn't even, what are we even talking about, right? I know it's confusing because there's, there's cultural things in the first century that we just don't apply today, and that makes it confusing. But right off the bat, you need to see that men and women are praying and prophesying in the local church. That's not what he's talking about. Right? He's going to talk about that in chapter 14. But right now, Men, men and women, they're teaching, they're prophesying, they're talking, they're praising. Like, he's not even talking about that. What he's talking about is that men are acting like women, and women are acting like men. You're like, Michael, that sounds just like what we're talking about in 2023. I know. They were confused in their culture just as we get confused in our culture today. 
right? And so what it, what it means that in chapter 4, in, in chapter 11, verse 4, you have men that are appearing as women. In, chapter, in verse 5, you have women that are appearing as men. And the Apostle Paul is like, hey, you're, you're getting confused in this area. It's not about a head covering. It's not about whether you should wear a hat or not wear a hat in a worship service. It's about what the head covering communicated to the culture of the day. Does that make sense? Today, we need to ask ourselves that question. I mean, what, what communicates manhood in our culture today? What communicates womanhood in our culture today? Right? You could push back. You say, Michael, all that kind of stuff, uh, that's all, that's all, what's the word? I just went blank on it. Social constructs, Michael. That's all social constructs, and so none of that matters. Yeah, I get it. It is social constructs, but at the same time, we need to be aware of what we're doing, what we're wearing, what we're saying, and how that's communicated and how that's interpreted, right? Right? So when Harry Styles wears a dress, like in our culture today, we all think, why is he dressing like a woman? Right? If a woman today wears pants, we don't think twice about that. That's no big deal. But maybe 50, 75 years ago, if a woman wears pants, we would have thought, why is she dressing like a, like a man? Right? And so we need to be thinking about that. Man, how do we hold to a biblical view of male and female? Right? We don't want to lose sight of that. That's what he's saying to the Corinthian church. Like, you've gotten confused in this area. And we can't be too hard on the Corinthian church. I mean, look at what we've been studying so far. Chapters 1 to 4, they're quarreling. Chapter 5, there's a man having sex with his stepmom. It's openly known about. Nobody has a problem. Chapter 6, married people aren't having sex with each other. Chapter 7, single people are having sex with everyone. And then chapters 8, 9, and 10... He's talked to them about engaging the culture, and then we get to chapter 11 and come to find out the culture is influencing the church instead of the church influencing the culture. And so he's pressing in on them. It's like, hey, you don't want to lose sight of that. Little girls, little boys, they can play in the mud, play with trucks, wear dresses. It doesn't matter. They're little boys, they're little girls. But as those little girls and little boys become big boys and big girls... We want to hold tightly to what it means to have biblical manhood and biblical womanhood and be able to teach them, right? Being male and female, it's important. We don't want to lose sight of that. Look at verse 6. He keeps going. For if a woman does not cover her head, let her also have her hair cut off. But if it's a disgrace, Graceful for a woman to have her hair cut off or her head shaved, let her cover her head. See, in the context of the passage, when a woman's head was shaved, it was a connotation of um, like criminal offense. uh, That maybe she had uh, been caught in adultery uh, or maybe she had crossed the line in in some type of legal way. And so as punishment, her her head would would be shaved. And, and, and it communicated something to that culture of that day. They were dabbling in, like, ungodliness when they began to gather as a, as a church family. But in no way is that to give a connotation that the Bible is oppressive towards women. I mean, Jesus was constantly engaging women, involving women, teaching women, empowering women, equipping women. So it's not about being oppressive towards women. It's about holding on to these, this idea of a biblical manhood and womanhood. Look at verses 7, 8, and 9. He says, For a man ought not to have his head covered, since he is the image and glory of God. But the woman is the glory of man. For man does not originate from woman, but woman from man. For indeed, man was not created for the woman's sake, but woman for the man's sake. Okay, you see that? That's what... It's tough, right? We read that. Don't go too fast. Man does not originate from woman, but woman from man. 
For indeed, man was not created for this woman's sake, but woman for the man's sake, right? At the first glance, it looks offensive, but what you need to know, the language that he's using in verses 7, 8, and 9, it's a throwback to Genesis chapter 2. He does the same thing in 1 Timothy chapter 2. He's talking about the role of men, the role of women. He doesn't just give his opinion of the day. He goes to Genesis chapter 2. When Jesus talks about the role of men, the role of women in the uh, Gospels, read it. He goes back to Genesis 2. And we don't have time to go there, but in Genesis chapter 2, we see that, that the God of Scripture, he intimately creates Adam. He breathes life into Adam. He places him into creation. He says it's very good. And then he says to Adam, but it's not good for man to be alone. This is Genesis chapter 2. There's foundational themes that trickle into all of humanity. That it's not good for man to be alone. I mean, think about that. If you read this on your own, you might just skim over it. But if you, if you sit in it and you wrestle with it, you think to yourself, like, well, Adam's not alone. Like, he's surrounded by animals, lions and tigers and bears. Oh, my. He's not alone. He's in intimate relationship with the God of Scripture. This is before Genesis chapter 3. This is before sin enters into the equation. So in Genesis chapter 2, he says it's not good for man to be alone. Adam's not alone. And because what he's communicating is that male and female are equally made in the image of God, but there's different roles. They're equally valuable with different roles. And so he says, he says to Adam, I will make him a helper suitable. So in Genesis chapter 2, we see equal value but different roles. We see Adam given responsibility, spiritual authority to care for creation. And we see that Eve is given the role of being a helper suitable. So that in a husband and wife relationship, you have a spiritual leader and you have a suitable helper. But in our ears today in 2023, we're like, suitable helper? What? That sounds condescending. But it's not. It's meant to be complementary. Right, the fact that the Holy Spirit is described as helper. You think the Holy Spirit is condescending? No, it's a, it's a powerful force that's brought into the marriage. That, that marriage can be beautiful when the husband is spiritually taking that responsibility, when he's leading out, and when the wife comes alongside as a complimentary helper. And when that happens, you see the beauty of marriage being put on display. Listen, this is so applicable to our day because in our current generation, most young people don't want to even get married. Marriage is a joke. They're like, no way. I'm going to put marriage off forever if possible. If they happen to get married, you know what you will most often see? You will either see a dominant wife or you'll see a dominant husband. And then surprise, that marriage is going to break down because nobody wants to be dominated. But God's word says no. It's not the male that's dominating. It's not the female that's dominating, but they're complementary towards one another. They're both equally valuable with different roles. Like I, I'm going slow on this because I know this is sensitive language in our culture today. It's very popular to be anti-patriarchal, right? You've got to watch out for those men, right, to be, to be anti-masculinity, male What's the word? Toxic. There you go. Toxic masculinity. I know. It's very popular in our culture today, right? So as a follower of Jesus, we can absolutely agree with some of those things. Like anytime you see a male dominating a female, we can absolutely speak out against that. Anytime you see a male being verbally abusive, emotionally abusive, uh, physically abusive, spiritually abusive, towards a female or any other male, like any person, whether it's at the corporate level, the government level, or in the local church. Absolutely, as a follower of Jesus, we can say, stop it. Like, that is not okay. But just because we speak out against those things doesn't mean we need to give way of male and female so that male and female are basically the same. No, they're both equally valuable in different roles. And you see that expressed in the local church in two primary ways. So we're getting to the practical. The first primary, primary way you will see 
This being lived out in the life of North Village Church is in the role of our elders. Like God's Word teaches us that women and men are invited to participate in every level of participation in the local church, but specifically, the role of an elder is for biblically qualified men described in 1 Timothy chapter 2, which Paul takes you back to Genesis chapter 2 because he's trying to capture that spiritual authority that was given to Adam in Genesis chapter 2. So that the local church and the family home is a mirror to one another. They're a model to one another. It's the, it's the micro family home and the macro where all these families come together. So in the local church, you want to see godly men, our elders, who are leading out Follow me as I follow Christ, just like we saw in verse uh, 1, all right? So you not only want to see that in the, in, the home, in the church level, but you also want to see that at the home level so that you have a husband who's a spiritual leader, right, who's taking that responsibility, and that a wife is coming alongside him to be a suitable helper, to compliment him. Right? It doesn't mean that the husband needs to have all the answers. It doesn't mean that he needs to be the most smart biblical scholar in the room. It does mean that he's taking spiritual responsibility, that he's making sure that the family's connected to a local church. He's making sure that husband and wife are praying together. It doesn't mean she can never say, let's pray. It just means if nobody's praying, that the husband is the one who says, hey, I've dropped the ball, we need to pray that he's the one that's making sure the children are connected to the local church, that he's the one that if there's conflict in the home, he doesn't brush it under the rug. He doesn't give in to passivity. He raises his hand and says, hey, I don't have the answers, but this needs to be talked about. Right? That's what he's talking about there, that in the local church that we're holding on to this value, that there's spiritual leadership in the elder role of a local church and in the home. And that's how our passage applies to Father's Day, right? At the surface, that this is a passage, it's talking about women wearing hats. But below the surface, this is really a challenge to our men, to every male in this room, right? That God has given you a role of spiritual leadership, of responsibility that you cannot overlook. You didn't earn it. It's a gift from God. And if I'm going to stand on this stage and call our women in our church family to follow that spiritual leadership, then men, you need to take this responsibility serious. As elders in our church family, like we take it serious. We don't just throw anybody into the elder role. We have a 12-month training ground where we are looking behind the curtain of that person, of that man in our church family, so that we can point to him and say, follow him as he follows Christ. To the husbands in our church family, like, don't give in to passivity. Embrace it. Because you're a male, you've been given this responsibility. Right? So, so lean into it. Learn God's word. Don't just see God's word as some you know, little thoughts to consider, but learn it. Grow in God's word. Get connected to other men. Get sharpened by other men. Step into this this God-given gift of spiritual responsibility because it makes a difference, especially in our church family when we're going through this transition. What an opportunity, not just for the women to step up and lean in, but for the men to step up and lean in. That's the opportunity we have for our church family. Look at verse 10. He says in verse 10, he says, Therefore, the woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head, because of the angels. There's an explanation. This head covering, it's not about a hat. It's about a symbol. It doesn't make sense to us. The the connotation doesn't translate to us. And so we need to ask ourselves today, well, what does communicate that? If somebody were to walk in off the street, what would communicate our commitment to the role of men and women, to that spiritual authority, to that suitable helper, what would that look like practically? I mean, it probably isn't hats. I mean, you can wear a hat if you want to, but it it probably isn't a hat that's going to communicate that to our day in 2023. In 1 Timothy, the Apostle Paul talks about women wearing gold and pearls. 
He said, because in that culture, gold and pearls communicated and conveyed a sensuality. That doesn't translate today. You can wear gold and pearls if you want. But we need to think about what does communicate that. I think probably the lowest hanging fruit is that we have men that are engaged. Right? If we look at our church family and we see women doing everything, women praying, women leading groups, women opening God's word, women serving, women paying the bills, women, you know, <laughs> praise God we have women that do that. We also want to make sure we have men that do that. Praise God we see that in our church family, right? We want to keep seeing that, that men aren't just observing God's hand at work in the life of our church, but we're participating as well. As a church family, us holding to a biblical view of qualified men as elders, that's a part of it. When people in Austin hear that that's what we hold to as a church family, it ruffles feathers. Why do you think that? What does that mean? Well, when we do that, we're, we're living out 1 Corinthians 11 to our culture. I think another possibility, it's not 100%, but when, when, when wives take their husband's last name in marriage, right, there's still a connotation of, of what that means when a wife does that. Right? And there might be professional reasons that a wife doesn't do that, right? but there's still a connotation that when a wife takes her husband's last name, it's not because the husband's trying to dominate her but that they are non-verbally communicating that the two have become one and that she respects his spiritual leadership and she wants to come alongside him as a suitable helper, right? That might be one way. Another way practically in, in, in our day in 2023 is how we talk about our husbands and wives. I mean, that's pretty popular in our culture today to make fun of our spouses, right? Right? I mean, how many times have we been at a play date? We've been at somebody's house for coffee. We've, we've gone out for appetizers. And it isn't long before the conversation goes, have I told you about my spouse? Oh, my gosh. Listen to how stupid they are. It doesn't mean we can't have fun with our spouses, right? And we can talk about the challenges in our marriages. Like, it doesn't mean we need to kind of just act like it's not there. But that overall, that there's a tone of respect that's counter. That's radical to our culture. That when you're around the office and everybody's throwing their spouse under the bus, you don't participate. And maybe you even challenge. Yeah, yeah, there's some challenges in my marriage and my, my spouse isn't perfect, but I'm so thankful for the gift they are to me. I mean, that might stop the conversation in the workplace. Like, people don't talk like that. Like, that might be a way for us to live out what 1 Corinthians 11 is teaching more than whether or not you wear hats in worship on a Sunday. Let's look at verses 11 and 12 as he closes out. He says, however, in the Lord, neither is a woman independent of man, nor is a man independent of woman. Look at that. How come they never post that on social media? Like, look how clear that is. You're like, Michael, were you just making that up? No. He says, for as the woman originates from the man, so also the man has his birth through the woman, and all things originate from God. Do you see that? Just in case, like God's word is not belittling women. They're both male and female are equally valuable. They just have different roles, right? So that men and women are mutually complementing one another. Men and women, male and female, they're not supposed to be synonymous. Male and female aren't supposed to be gender fluid. It's not supposed to be indifferent. It doesn't matter. It does matter. We hold to these distinctives. In verses 4 to 10, the woman is stepping into that role as a suitable helper. In verses 11 to 12, the man is being reminded he's not independent. He's connected to the woman. Our culture says the, 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 the masculine male is, is a lone ranger. The masculine male, our culture says, marches to the beat of his own drum. He goes where he wants. He does what he wants. Ah, That's not what God's word teaches. God's word teaches us the, a biblical manhood. He's connected. He's connected to other, other men. He's connected to other women. He's connected to the body of Christ. So that's the challenge for us, church family, especially to our men in 2023. 
It applies to our women also, but especially to our men. In our culture in Austin, a man can give his life to his career. He won't connect himself to other people. He'll stay independent, and he'll, he'll wear the badge of being focused on his career. Listen to me. In our church family, we have men that work hard. We have women that work hard also. Praise God. There are, there are some people, sometimes people who profess faith in Jesus who don't like to work. Praise God. We have people who like to work, but we don't want to make that our identity. That's what he was talking to us about in 8, 9, and 10. We don't want to give ourselves to that idolatry. We want to work, and then we want to make sure that we're not giving our life just to our work. But as a husband, as a male, we have our character to tend to. We have God's word to tend to. We have our neighbors to tend to. We have the body of Christ to tend to. And those areas are just as important as our work. So with that in mind, I, I, I want us to kind of close out with just a challenge to our men. I want to invite our worship team up to the front, and uh, let's lower the lights. This is a challenge to our women as well, but specifically because it's Father's Day, I just want to give kind of a closing challenge to our, to our men. Whether you're 13 years old or older, whether you're a husband, whether you're single, right? it's Father's Day. This is an opportunity for, for our men to open their hearts, to open their eyes, to open their lives to this gift of spiritual leadership. You didn't earn it. It's not because you're smart. It's not because you're strong. It's just because you're a man. He's given you this gift. So I want to capture it with this picture. It's a picture of a bird. I was in... Charleston, South Carolina this last week. And this, is, this bird is called an American oyster catcher. Look at that beak. An American oyster catcher. And surprisingly, you know what he does? He eats oysters. Yeah. And I don't know if you've worked around oysters a lot, but they're not easy to open. And even with a beak like that, he can't make the oyster open. And so you know what the American oyster catcher does? Is he, he comes and he finds that oyster and he just waits. And he waits and he waits and he waits. And then eventually, that oyster's got to open up. Eventually, that oyster's got to take a drink of water. And eventually, that oyster just starts to kind of slowly open. As soon as he does, the American oyster catcher sticks that long beak in that wedge, pops it open, and devours the meat oyster. I learned about this bird this week, and I thought to myself, especially with Father's Day coming, man, you know what? A lot of times, men can, we can be like those oysters, right? We can have that hard exterior. We keep ourselves closed up real tight. We keep ourselves distant from others. We keep ourselves distant from God. In some ways, we can keep ourselves distant from ourselves. Like, we don't even want to think about those things. And we just want to be like that oyster, just held up really tight. And you need to know that the God of Scripture, he's a lot like that American oyster catcher. Yeah, he's waiting. He's waiting. He's waiting. Because he knows at some point, something's going to happen in life. And we're going to open up. It might be circumstances, it might be relational challenges, it might be in our career, but something happens in our lives where we start to open up just a smidgen, just a little bit. And in that moment, the God of Scripture, he sticks that oyster catcher beak in there and just opens up our hearts. And so that's what I want to invite our men to do. That this is an opportunity on Father's Day in 2023 is to open up our lives to the God of Scripture to allow him to speak in, to how, allow his Holy Spirit. So I just want you to ask yourself, men, these, women, these questions apply to women as well, but specifically to our men. Is there a part of your life that you're holding back on? Is there a part of your character that you've closed off?
Are there things that you're doing in your private life that you don't want anybody else to know about? You're trying to keep hidden and closed off in darkness. Are there conversations with your spouse or with a family member that you know you know they need to happen and you just, you just won't do it? Well, I want to invite you this morning to open up. You're not opening up to me. You're not opening up to our church family. You're opening up to the God of Scripture. You see, he could force you to open up, but he doesn't want to force you. He wants you to open up willingly. Would you do that this morning? And just to seal it, it's not for me, it's not for our church family, it's for, for each of the men in our church family, just to seal the area of life that he's poking in on us right now. I just want to invite you, if the, if the Lord is asking you to open up, if there's an area of your life that you want to open up, would you just stand up where you're seated? It's just a way to physically demonstrate that, Lord, you want to open up your life to the Lord. You want to invite him into your life. You want to invite him to work in an area of your life. You're physically demonstrating a willing heart to the Lord that you don't want to give in to passivity. You don't want to listen to the influences of our culture. That you want to listen to God's word. You want to be a godly man. A man that's courageous and strong and for him. I just invite you to stand. So I'm going to pray over you. I'm going to pray just a blessing to the men in our church family. If you haven't stood up, do so now. Just ask, asking the Lord to move, to make a strong man, godly men, courageous men, men of character, men of boldness, that there would be an aroma about us, not because of us, but because of the holiness of God that's in us and through us. And so, Father in heaven, we thank you for the men that you've brought to North Village Church. We thank you for men that are wanting to grow. They're men that want to know your word. They're men that want to be strong in you. Men that are honest. We're honest about where we're weak. We don't have it all figured out. We don't have all the answers. But we want to be men that live for you. So in the name of Jesus, in the power of the Holy Spirit, Father, I pray, I pray that you would deepen the men in our church family that there would be a language that we develop with the men in our church family, that there would be a look that we give to the men in our church family, that when we look at each other a certain way, we know what it means to be shoulder to shoulder, armor bearers for one another, for your glory. We praise you. We thank you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Y'all stand. Let's sing.